As you turn to the third part of the Communist Manifesto, you may wonder what's going on here. Aren't socialists all supposed to be on the same page with each other? Why are Marx and Engels engaging in all of this examination and criticism of these various forms of socialism? Shouldn't they all be aligned with each other? And as we're going to see, the communists have some pretty severe criticisms of why some of the other socialist movements, which, which are arising as a response to what's going on in bourgeois society in the, the late 18th and early 19th century, why these movements are not going to deliver on the promises of changing the condition of the proletariat as the communists say that they'll be able to do. So I, I've put on this this board a uh, sort of chart with all the different breakdowns of the different kinds of socialism that Marx is criticizing, reactionary socialism, which has three parts, feudal socialism, petty bourgeois socialism, and German or true socialism, true should be in quotes there, conservative or bourgeois socialism, and finally critical utopian socialism and communism. And Marx and Engels are, are targeting different aspects of each of these movements. So we're going to go through these in part because a lot of times when you're, when you're looking at a philosophy or a philosophical perspective, you can see what they're proposing not only when they're positively advancing something of their own, but when they're saying something else isn't good enough, something else isn't going to work. There's a, there's a point of comparison there. And the communists are going to be putting themselves forward as the only really true choice for proletariats who, who actually want to get something done, who want to change the fundamental conditions of inequality and exploitation that he's been diagnosing. So let's look at, at what he's calling reactionary socialism. First, there's feudal socialism, which he says you can understand as being the last-ditch efforts of the aristocracy, but also of the clergy. And, and these were two classes that had been directly targeted by the French Revolution, that in other parts of Europe had been losing power. Um, he's going to talk a little bit later about what's going on in Germany at the time. And what do they do? Do they, do they take the side of the proletariat? Not really. They're more anti-bourgeoisie, than they are pro-proletariat. And why? Because they see the bourgeoisie as having taken their power away, as having supplanted them in, in terms of uh, where society is going and who calls the shots and how things are arranged. So as Marx will, will say, um, in order to arouse sympathy, the aristocracy was obliged to lose sight of its own interests and formulate this indictment against the proletariat in the interest of the exploited working class alone. And, and he says, you know, a lot of this is just sort of satire and lampoons. It's not to be taken all that seriously. But um, if we do take it seriously, we find that this can't possibly provide us with a solution. In part because he says, in pointing out that their mode of exploitation, because the, the, you know, the aristocracy, the nobles, did exploit the hell out of everybody, uh, that their mode of exploitation was different to that of the bourgeoisie, the feudalists forget that times have changed. As he's going to say, they exploited under circumstances and conditions that were quite different, and they are now antiquated. The, the progress of modern civilization and capitalism has, as we've seen, effaced all of these old distinctions, and the aristocracy are just not going to be able to get those back. Um, Marx says something similar about um, the clergy as well. He says, um, clerical socialism is, is the Christian equivalent of it. Nothing is easier than to give Christian asceticism a socialist tinge. Christian asceticism means this doing without, this you know, preaching abstinence, um, austerity, you know, for the good of your soul. He says, has not Christianity claimed against private property, against marriage, against the state? Has it not preached in the place of these charity and poverty, celibacy and mortification of the flesh, monastic life and mother church? Christian socialism is but the holy water with which the priest consecrates the heart burnings of the aristocrats. So he's saying, look, you know, Christian socialism 
doing the same thing essentially as aristocratic socialism saying things were better back then, you didn't have a proletariat. And it's interesting, he says, that um, the, uh, the, the real accusation that they have to make is that under the bourgeoisie, a class is being developed which is going to be revolutionary. So he says, um, what they upbraid the, the bourgeoisie with is not that it creates a proletariat, that it creates poor people, working people, that can't get out of that, it is that it creates a revolutionary proletariat. So this is just a, a reactionary mode. And now it does you know, propose a kind of socialism, but it's not one that's going to be of any help. What about petty bourgeois um, socialism? Now when he's talking about the petty bourgeois, um, what we're talking about are the, the people who are able to engage in these capitalist processes of production, who have people working for them, uh, perhaps in their shop, perhaps small business owners, but they're in a precarious situation in, in, in modern capitalism. Why is that? Well, think about what happens when big corporations and big box stores come to small towns. What ends up happening is many of the local business owners end up having to go out of business. They drop their prices as much as they can, but they find it difficult to compete with the big box store, which has economies of scale. They're buying goods in massive amounts at great discounts and then offering them to other people. So the, the petty bourgeois are, are severely threatened by the ongoing progress of capitalist society. Um, same thing goes for you know, any, anything that could be turned into a chain. So think about the, you know, the, the hair cutters who have to compete with hair cutting chains that offer some sort of, you know, reliable service up to certain standards. It, it's difficult for them to compete unless they have some, some other things going for them. So he says that the, the, um, uh, the, the petty bourgeoisie fluctuates between proletariat and bourgeoisie. If they manage to make it big, then they become the bourgeoisie. They end up running their own show. They become a corporation or something like that in our, our own time. Or they get bought out by a big corporation, then they invest their money in the stock market. But if they don't make it, then they fall into the proletariat. And now they have to you know, work like everybody else. Um, it's interesting because a lot of small business owners go through a period where they are, you know, delivering pizzas at night to try to, you know, provide the seed money for what they're doing. Working at Best Buy, a friend of mine who's, who's uh, got a good computer company, that's how he, he made his start while he was just getting started. And you can become trapped in that. Um, now, what do they want to do? They just want to restore the old conditions of production. They don't actually want to transform society, and what they want is something that they can't have. Once the big box store has come into town, you can't turn the clock back. You can't get Main Street back. And that's what they're trying to do. Um, he says that they, they want to, they're, they're actually doing some good, good work in, in showing the disastrous effects of machinery and division of labor, the concentration of land and capital in a few hands, overproduction crises, the ruin of the petty bourgeoisie and the peasant, the misery of the proletariat, anarchy and production. They're actually on track with that sort of stuff, but the remedy that they propose isn't going to work because what do they propose? They want to either restore the old means of production and exchange, like, you know, produce medieval guilds again. That's not going to work. Or they want to impose limits on production and exchange so that they can cramp the modern means of production within the framework of the old property relations that have been since then superseded. So that also is not going to work. You notice we've got two different classes here that, are try that have come out on, the, on the, the bad end of the stick in the capitalist transformation in industrial society, and they're trying to propose something for the proletariat and say, hey, you guys, let, this will be better if we do this. Don't, don't do what the bourgeoisie are doing. But what they're proposing is just old stuff. We have something a little bit different when we get to German or true socialism. Um, Marx and Engels are, are saying 
these, these Germans, and remember at the time that he's writing, we don't have one single German state. Germany is in the process of consolidating. There are some major players like uh, Prussia and Bavaria and you know a few other states within there and there's sort of a question about who's going to unify Germany but but there's a lot of little tiny principalities where the arist the aristocrats are, are running the show and in the state like Prussia it's the old nobility who are running the show and in Bavaria it's a king so in Germany you've got different circumstances than you have in France in France where the revolution happened you have bourgeois society with industrial manufacturing going on. You have the, the uh, uh, proletariat who is becoming more and more and more impoverished. And Germany is not quite in that situation. France also got rid of the nobility and got rid of the king, if you remember right, because of the French Revolution. So although they had a, you know, interregnum, you might say, with Napoleon acting sort of like a king and an emperor, eventually they end up uh, with, with parliamentary politics and the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie dominating. German or true socialism isn't going to work because the Germans are taking ideas that make sense in the context of the French situation and they're bringing them over to a, a more primitive state of society where the real question is not what are the bourgeoisie and the proletariats going to do with each other, but rather the ruling class who happen to be the nobles or, or the, the monarch, how are we going to get them out? And that's a question for the bourgeoisie. So the Germans then start talking in terms like I put here of humanity rather than the proletariat. And this takes their focus away from the real interests of the proletariat. According to Marx and Engels, this, this talk about humanity in general is really just a cover for um, ideas that don't mean anything or a cover for bourgeois society. The biggest problem, though, is that German or true socialism ends up playing into the hands of the German nobility or the, the aristocracy. Because the, the bourgeoisie are not as strong in Germany as they are in France. They're struggling to, to take over, to assume power against the aristocracy. Um, the German or true socialism provides a kind of convenient pretext for the aristocracy to actually crack down on what the... Um, what the uh, German bourgeoisie is trying to do. What the bourgeoisie wants is a liberalization of, of property relations, of politics, all those sorts of things. They want something more like re, you know, post-revolutionary France. And so, like he says, true socialism served the government as a weapon for fighting the German bourgeoisie. It represented a reactionary interest. Um, to preserve this class is to preserve the existing state of things in Germany. He's talking about the aristocratic class. The industrial and political supremacy of the bourgeois threatens it with certain destruction from the concentration of capital and from the rise of a revolutionary proletariat. So it seems like, like German or true socialism can deal with that, but it's not actually offering anything to the proletariat who are in, indeed you know, starting to emerge in Germany as a suffering class. So that's all reactionary socialism. When we turn to conservative or, or bourgeois socialism, um, and he, Marx brings up a few people like, like Fourier, um, we probably don't know, but, but very interesting to read. What they want to do is to address the grievances that are arising, like this, these working conditions are terrible, or we don't have any money left, and we're seeing these rich people living a, a, you know, a great life. What's going on with that? There's grievances that the poor have, the working poor, and why do they want to address those grievances? To keep the whole system from going haywire, falling apart, and being overthrown in, in some sort of revolution. So the proposal, as Marx puts it, is really to have a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. Now, you might say, you know, that's kind of a, an interesting idea, but it probably doesn't have any relevance today. But if you think about things in Marxist terms today, what is it that uh, political parties quite often want to offer as their plan 
for prosperity for the nation. We're going to deal with poverty. And the way that we're going to deal with poverty is all the poor people are going to have jobs. And they're all going to have jobs in high tech because we're going to invest a ton of money in education. And then, you know, they'll come out of the colleges and there'll be all these jobs open for them. The knowledge economy. That's the same thing today as what Marx is criticizing back in, in the 1840s. So... He talks about them as, as wanting to turn everybody into a bourgeoisie or bourgeois. Why? Because to be bourgeois is to be, you know, well off, to be human. We'll, we'll just raise the general level and everybody can have some capital. Everybody can have some wealth. But you can't have a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. Not under modern industrial processes of production and exchange, according to, to the communists. So this takes a couple forms, you know. There's systems that they try to, try to bring about that, you know, everybody's going to have their little place and everything will fit in together. Well, that's one way to try to do it. Um, another way to try to do it is to do gradual reforms in terms of governmental administration. The problem with that is, is that they don't actually change the fundamental condition of class conflict between the exploitative capitalist bourgeois class, which is deriving most of the benefits, and the exploited proletariat class. All they do is they make the system work a bit more efficiently, so perhaps the, the proletariats get a little bit out of it. But there's still massive inequalities and imbalances in, in the system after these reforms take place. They don't actually bring about a change in the material conditions of existence. Um, so, like he says, bourgeois socialism attains adequate expression when and only when it becomes a mere figure of speech, and he makes fun of some of this for the benefit of the working class. Free trade for the benefit of the working class. But does free trade really work to the benefit of the working class, or does it work against them? Uh, Marx says that it goes against them. Protective duties for the benefit of the working class. That's the opposite of free trade, by the way. Custom uh, duties. Um, prison reform for the benefit of the working class. And he says, this is the last word and the only seriously meant word of bourgeois socialism. It is summed up in the phrase, the bourgeois is a bourgeois for the benefit of the working class. And again, you see that his criticism is this form of socialism doesn't really fix the, the significant problems. Now we get to something a little bit more interesting. And Marx starts out talking here about some of the very early attempts to try to, you know, bring about a utopia to change conditions where the, the laborers are fighting against the new conditions in which they're, and he talks about the first direct attempts of the proletariat to attain their ends, and these, these were um, involving uh, universal asceticism and social leveling in its crudest form. What he has in mind there is the sort of things going on with the levelers and the diggers and all these different uh, millennia sects in England. And in a few and other places as well. Then he passes on and he's talking about, well, what about in the, in the current day? There are people who see the proletariat as fundamentally lacking any sort of initiative. They're not able to develop a political uh, articulation, a party, a movement of their own that could really fix things. Um, and they tend to look at the proletariat as just the suffering class as those who are deserving of, of, of being helped out because they're suffering. Not because they're the ones who actually produce all of the, the goods, but just because things are unfair for them, they're, they're suffering, they don't have enough to eat, they're being treated unjustly. And what they do is they cast around for some sort of new social theory some sort of new explanation. Marx talks about it, and Marx and Engels talks about it in terms of a new social science after new social laws that are supposed to create conditions that will change class antagonism. Um, so he says in, in the formation, or he says, um, the undeveloped state of the class struggle causes socialists of this kind to consider themselves 
far superior to all class antagonisms. And that's a problem for, for Marx. Anybody, this is also a problem for German socialism too, by the way. Anybody who thinks that they're above ideology, that they're above identifying with a particular class, is probably fooling themselves as far as Marx and Engels are concerned. Um, what they end up doing that, he re that they really disagree with is they reject political and revolutionary action. They try to produce changes in society solely through nonviolent and through um, gradual action that would, would be, you know, uh, people would sort of agree to and, and move towards. That's what makes them utopian. And that only works for a short time when you get like-minded people together and you put them together in some place um, like, like these various utopian communes that have been tried, they usually can't last very long. And the problem is they don't change anything in the outside society. They create a little microcosm where there might be more equitable sharing of wealth, um, but they don't change the fundamental condition of, of the world. The other thing that he criticizes them for is producing reactionary sects. So you'll have some great theorist who comes up with some ideas, and, and they're actually being quite revolutionary in the realm of ideas, but not in the realm of action. And then their followers crystallize it, and they say, this is the way it's got to be. And, and it turns into something that's reactionary rather than being critical. Um, he does think that they, they were able to identify some important ideas, um, he says, they attack every principle of existing society, so they're full of valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. And he talks about some of the practical measures that they propose, like abolition of the distinction between town and country. That's an interesting idea. Um, abolition of the family, the carrying on of industries for the account of private individuals, ab abolishing the wage system. Um, conversion of the function of the state into more superintendents of production. All of these are, are good ideas, but the fact that they reject political and revolutionary action means that they're never going to happen. Now, this is a good jumping off point to the very final fourth section, where Marx says, put all this stuff aside, the Communist Party is a party for action for the working class. He says, they fight for the attainment of the immediate aims and the momentary interests of the working class, but they also think ahead to the future. They take care of the future of the movement. How do they do this? Well, depending on what country we're talking about, they take strategic positions. So in a country where it's the bourgeoisie and, and the proletariats, and that's all that's going on. They're definitely on the side of the proletariats. They may line up with the bourgeoisie in order to get rid of the aristocratic ruling class so that then they can criticize the bourgeoisie afterwards. And this is what he's talking about going on in Germany. He says, they never cease to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat so that the German workers may straightaway use the social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must introduce along with their supremacy. So he says, they'll, they'll support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. They're different than a lot of these other things. They're not trying to go back to some past position. They recognize that industrial society is here to stay. They're not just trying to reform or fix the system, but rather to smash it and rebuild it. And they are willing to engage in violent action in order to accomplish that uh, because they align themselves with the proletariat. So the entire manifesto ends on a very uh, you know, high note, as manifestos tend to. He says, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. And then the, the call, the imperative, is working men of all countries unite. Um, why working men of all countries, or working men and women of all countries? Because communism, speaking for the proletariat in industrial society, is articulating a, a worldview that says that what fundamentally matters are those who are productive, those who are in the class of the producers, 
And it, only by all of them putting aside their nationality, their old traditions, all of these sorts of things that separate them, um, will this situation be changed and a new situation be entered into?